Okay. Welcome everyone to our coffee break chat. We are in June. We have been doing programming on Zoom for well over a month at this point. And I'm not going to claim that we have solved every problem and worked out every kink in the system, as you all know from any experiences you've had on Zoom. But I do think we have come to find that these coffee break chats are a really fun time and a chance to learn about preservation history. So if you happen to have your cup of joe handy, since this is a coffee break chat, I invite you to join me in a toast to Helena Rosenthal and the Upper East Side. Cheers. So my name, for those of you who do not know me, is Brad Vogel, and I am the executive director of the New York Preservation Archive Project. So what do we do? We focus on the history of the preservation movement in New York City. There is so much to lift up, to uncover, and to highlight about the history of preservation. The people, that is really what it comes down to in the end. We think about the buildings and the buildings, the built environment is very important, but it's about the people. Who actually gave up that, going to that practice of their child? Who gave up that meal that they were going to have with a friend? Who gave up that weekend to do work to save historic structures and part of the soul of the city. We get into that. And so today's program's a fine example of a chance to learn about one little facet of that overall story. And I wanted to thank our sponsors, CTA Architects PC, for their support of our Zoom programming. So thank you to Dan Allen and company uh, for that. And I also wanted to say thanks, and I know that Felicia and Lara are joining us, and Franny, and all kinds of people from Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. Thank you so much for helping with the promo today for today's event. And, you know, it makes sense. It's just ever so slightly relevant to the history of Friends as a group. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce someone who has been a great mentor to me, and someone who has been intimately involved in the Upper East Side, um, and someone who knew Helena Rosenthal, the subject of our talk today, very well. Anthony C. Wood, someone you may have heard of before, is a preservationist, an author, a teacher, historian, and grant maker. He's currently the executive director of the Idelson Foundation, and he's worked for the J.M. Kaplan Fund and the Landmarks Preservation Commission, as well as the Municipal Arts Society. For over 20 years, he was a member of the adjunct faculty at Columbia University, in the uh, Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. And as many of you know, and as I'm certainly glad, Tony is the author of Preserving New York, Winning the Right to Protect a City's Landmarks. So without further ado, Mr. Wood, take it away. Thank you, thank you, Brad. Well, this is, this is a lot of fun. Uh, the Archive Project, we focus on a lot of preservation heroes uh, many of them are from the distant past, like George McEnany or Albert Bard or Andrew Haswell Green. Uh, but it's more important, actually, to honor preservation icons uh, before they're forgotten completely. Uh, and so today we're really focusing in on a preservation icon of modern preservation history, or I, I'll regard it still as modern preservation history. The wonderful, and I think it's correct to say unique, Helena Rosenthal. So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of provide a general framework of some basic information on Helena, how the historic district happened, which is kind of how Helena then ended up being the czarina of the Upper East Side or whatever other term you might wanna use. Uh, and then we're gonna talk more about her as a person and her advocacy and kind of the special nature of her. Uh, and that piece of the conversation, I'm going to be inviting in uh, some friends of Helena's and friends of mine who I will introduce at that time. But to set the stage, uh, let me just jump in with some background information. So, you know, who was Helena and how did she get involved in all of this? Uh, she was a physically described as tiny person at times, uh, but with a huge impact, uh, well beyond her size, had a very discreet, charming accent a very distinctive advocacy style that we're gonna hear about. And she was married to Tony Rosenthal, the sculptor who did uh, the Alamo sculpture, which some people remember down uh, at, uh, down uh, on the, by the subway station there. 
so she was part of, you know, she was in the art circle. Uh, before they came to New York, they lived in California. And if my memory is right, they had a house in California that burned down in one of the wildfires. Um, we, uh, one of the purposes of having the guests join me, my friends on this, is to correct any mismemories I have. So anything I say may be corrected later in the program. Um, so anyway, she came to New York and got involved in preservation in 1973 when she purchased 173 East 73rd Street. And I think, Brad, you're going to start putting some images up at some point. I hope. There we go. Um, that's take us. Yes, yeah, so you're going to take us back. There we go uh, to the images. So like many good preservationists, she started uh, focused on her own block in her own house. So her headquarters was 173 73rd Street. Uh, she then got involved with her block association. That's her house, 173 73rd. Uh, then, as I say, got involved in the block association and really became a recognized, and there's a picture of the larger block. So she got really recognized as a kind of community leader in preservation. Uh, and we now get to, I'm going to put some dates out just so we can ground all this. So we're now in the late 70s, 1978, 1979. Uh, I was lucky enough to have just come to New York in 1978. And I was at that time working for the city councilwoman who represented that part of New York City, who was a fervent preservationist and very involved in helping kind of beat the drums for the historic district. So in the spring of 1979, the committee for the Upper East Side Historic District was formed uh, by the Municipal Arts Society with prominent co-chairs of Lily Auchincloss, Brendan Gill, Tammy Grimes, Wade North Seymour, and indeed Jane Trichter. So the campaign was launched to get a district. Uh, MAS was behind that. At the time, it was called the Bose Art District. Kaplan Fund put some money into that. Uh, we then have a very fortuitous event was that uh, a little history. Kent Barwick had become chair of the Landmarks Commission in 1978, and Kent had always been interested in an Upper East Side Historic District. So it was really one of his agendas, but Kent was always savvy enough to know that he needed, as a chairman, to be seen as responsive to the demands of the public as opposed to pushing his own agenda. So he managed behind the scenes to help make sure there was a public demand for the Upper East Side Historic District. So work closely with Jane and putting this committee together and beginning to organize the district. And of course, Helena was a natural person to be part of all that because of her role in the community. So we jump now to 1979, where we've got the hearing on the proposed Upper East Side Historic District, 350 letters of support, 65 people testifying, and of course, our friends at Revney opposing it. Uh, at that point, I moved from Jane Trichter's office to work the Landmarks Commission where the Landmarks Commission now went into the laborious research process that's required to tee thing up for a public hearing. And so uh, I kind of jumped to different roles. I then end up back at the municipal, or at the Municipal Arts Society as the whole effort to get the district designated happens. And so on my lapel, and John indicated he had one at home, I have my button for the Upper East Side Historic District campaign. And so finally, in May of May 1981, the Upper East Side Historic District gets designated. Almost immediately after that, there was a threat to the district. There was a proposed tower by Gondal Zonis that was going to be at 20, uh, 22 East 71st Street. The reason that's important is that triggered us at the time I was at MAS. We realized that if that the district was going to have these threats and that the district needed someone to protect it. So it made all the sense in the world to pull together the people who'd been involved in designating the district and part of that committee to help launch a group that would be the ongoing curator, steward, advocate for the Upper East Side Historic District. So I was at MAS at the time and we said, hey, this is needed. We've got to take it the next step, create this group. So we were able to get grant funds from the Kaplan Fund, scratch the surface, you find them everywhere, and Ronald Lauder. And at that time, the project coordinator who was brought in was one John Weiss, who will be joining us later in the call to help us remember those early days. Uh, and so at that time, uh, the Friends was you know, a project of the Municipal Arts Society, providing staffing, providing guidance. And who better to become the head of the Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District than Alina Rosenthal? And as we might just end it there by saying, and as we all know, the rest is history. 
So Helena became the head of Friends uh, and remained the head of Friends until she passed away. Under her expansive leadership, she added an S to the name of the organization and took over the entire Upper East Side, pretty much, by putting an S on historic districts. Um, so Helena as an, was, was a fun, just an incredible advocate. She operated from her house. She had a very distinctive advocacy style, highly personal, highly unprofessional. At one point, she'd ask me, as, as we, I got to know her, she said, well, Tony, you're a professional. Would you review this letter I've written? And if you looked at a Helena letter, it probably addressed four or five different subjects all in the same letter. It began on highly personal terms, you know, uh, dear Kent or somebody instead of the elected official. She'd begin by saying, I'm sitting out here on the dock out on Long Island thinking about the need to do this. And she, it would be this rambling. And being a trained preservation professional, I just in horror looked at this letter and I thought, my God, you know, I, there's nothing I can do with it. And then, of course, I quickly realized that was her power. She had the unique ability to be that way, to be herself, to be authentic, to be just incredibly personal. I would describe her advocacy style is she just drowned everyone in honey. She was sweet, she was persistent, but uh, I've jokingly, somewhat jokingly said the neighborhoods reflect their advocacy styles. So the Upper West Side has been effective throwing acid at people, the Upper East Side was affected drowning them in honey. Uh, both techniques have worked effectively. Here we have on the screen, Helena on the right, uh, we have Barbara Lee Dimestein in the middle and Bob Dreyfus, uh, who was the council member after Jane Trichter, who was also a very, uh, a very, very strong defender of historic preservation. Well, Helena, again, is a good preservationist, starting with her house, starting with her blocks, starting with her neighborhood, realized that if you were going to be an effective advocate for the Upper East Side, you had to be involved in larger issues. And so she became very involved in a lot of the citywide preservation issues that were happening then in the 80s. So whether it was St. Bart's, the theaters, the Flynn Walsh bill, uh, the Rizzoli battles on Fifth Avenue, uh, where Helena wrote to contacts in France to get a letter documenting La Ligue windows that were in those buildings because she had the French connection. So she expanded and became an integral part of the larger preservation community in New York City. So Helena died uh, in 1991 uh, and had what uh, I refer to as the first royal preservation funeral up at uh, St. John the Divine. Uh, Lori Beckelman, who will be joining us shortly, uh, her husband played a, a solo jazz uh, piece as everyone entered the cathedral. And I still have chills up my back when I think about how effective that all was. So I'm going to now uh, open the mic, or rather Brad is going to open the mic uh, to our guests. So in order of, somewhat in order of how they appeared on the scene, I would say, uh, Rita, I think you were there from the earliest days. Then John Weiss came as a, an MAS person who was then assigned to make help friends become an entity. Then uh, at some point, Britt appeared on the scene. Uh, I don't know if... Uh, and it, when, I don't know where offices, I can't remember, but the, there was an office originally at the Barbizon Hotel that we may hear about, and then it evolved to other quarters. Uh, great stories on all of that. And then jo joining us is the Honorable Lori Bethelman, uh, former chair of the Landmarks Commission, who knew Helena very well personally, and also interacted with her as an elected official, uh, receiving some of those wonderful missives. Um, before I, I go, one of the uh, other things I want to point out is, is Helena was multidimensional in a sense, besides preservation, had interest in art, obviously, but also she realized after the Upper East Side Historic District was designated that the landmark protection tool would not be sufficient to protect the neighborhood, that there, ought to have be, there needed to be compatible zoning. So one day she came to me and she said, Tony, I'm going to change the zoning on the Upper East Side. Again, as a professional, I thought this is ridiculous, but go for it, Alina, you know, why not? And of course she pulled it off and got the R8D mid block zoning, which has helped reinforce the character of the Upper East Side and, and beyond. So with that as framework and a little introduction, uh, I'm gonna start putting my friends on the spot. And John, maybe we'll just start with you chronologically and, and others can also jump in as subjects come up, but. Uh, so John, you, you have uh, gone from uh, a young uh, 
intern in preservation to now 19 years, the uh, assistant counsel, associate counsel at the Land Rest Commission. So obviously, friends is what launched your career and, and made you who you are today. I mean, that's obvious. But how about some of your memories of Alina in that time? Absolutely. But Tony, I have to correct you on something. Good, please. That's, that's... In, in some of her letters, you talk about four or five topics in one letter. I think she talked about four or five topics in one sentence. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. And actually, three or four letters in one day. Yes, yes. Because she was had these very uh, long sentences, kind of like Faulkner, and they usually have a lot of all caps or they'd be underlined and exclamation points. So she was very, not only very enthusiastic. Uh, in her personal demeanor and when she was speaking with you, but I think her writing style reflected that as well. And uh, as you mentioned, I was in college uh, and you hired me uh, for that summer after the designation of the historic district, but it was going before the board of estimate for the vote, I think in August of 81. And, and so I was brought on as a work study student to help work with you and Helena and uh, Joan Davidson and, and Rita and Ann Millard on organizing for the vote for the uh, Board of Estimate. Um, and, and I think you hit it right uh, on the head when you described Helena as using honey, because she was uh, such a very persistent advocate and she really used the charm offensive where she'd come up to someone with her charming French accent, she'd kiss them on both cheeks, she'd lavish them with praise and have a, a lovely conversation and then always be somehow pushing and pushing and pushing very politely, but very persistently for whatever she wanted to achieve in that conversation. Um, so as you said, uh, I'd worked with her um, that summer uh, and we spent much time in her uh, carriage house with her husband, Tony Rosenthal, who was uh, there putting up with her uh, uh, 18 hour a day effort on this. Um, I remember we had a uh, first board meeting um, and Celeste Holm was one of our uh, board members. Of course, I didn't know what she looked like. Helena didn't know what she looked like. And so when she walked into the first board meeting at the Urban Center at the Villard Houses, Helena and I both tried to you know, hush her up and say, oh, excuse me, you're in a private meeting. You need to leave the room now. And finally, someone, I think Joan Davidson said, no, that's Celeste Holm. You know, she's on the board. Um, uh, and I also want to note one thing about the name of the organization, Friends. I think that was a very um, conscious decision to come up with that name. And I think as Rita Chu had mentioned earlier, she wasn't really that adversarial in her approach to uh, pushing for preservation. And when we were discussing what the name of the organization should be, uh, she really wanted Friends to be the name to reflect the whole demeanor of how we would advocate for preservation in New York City. John, that's great, and I'm so glad we're recording this because some of these things uh, uh, have been lost to memory, so it's, it's great that, that you've got them. Um, Rita, let's, let's go to you for a little bit because you were there at, at the beginning, and you're there still today as, as a major part of Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District, so you've, you've had great staying power, and we're, we're indebted to you for, for that. Tony, I want to start off by correcting you also. Good, that's what it's all about. <laughs> you mentioned that when they bought the house at 73rd Street, you gave the impression that she went right into preservation and that's not true. What she's fond of telling everyone is that she started off by having trees planted. And as you know, she always took more territory than, than you, know, you would envision. So she was the Black Association president for the 73rd, 74th and 75th Streets and her start was planting trees. Excellent. The, uh, <laughs> the other thing is that, um, I'm, I, I think you should all feel sorry for me uh, for editing, for being the early editor of her letters and her newsletters. If, as you all know, her letters were long, really long. Her newsletters were really long to the point that she even wrote that, you know, you may not want to read this. But I think that uh, uh, John, John Weiss uh, characterized it correctly about her writing style. I mean, she was articulate in her own way, but the sentences were run-ons for on and on and on, and she liked to underline everything. And so here I am in the early years, she wanted me to edit all her work. It was hell. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to jump to the end that I want to uh, have Lori probably, you know, tell us more about the background. But one of the yeah. most memorable thing for me about Helena was the end. And I mean her memorial service. It was the best memorial service I've ever attended. And I remember getting there early. It was at the St. John the Divine. 
and uh, it was a beautiful April day, a beautiful spring day. The magnolias were in full bloom, and the peacocks, I think there, there were at least two of them just, you know, roaming around. And when I, as one of the early uh, uh, um, guests came in, you would hear Billie Holiday, yeah. if you remember the Billie Holiday uh, songs that were playing overhead as we we're being uh, uh, escorted to our seats. And then we would hear Randy Jones, is, was that your, is that your husband's name, Lori? Yes. He would be playing, wow, the drums. It was just dramatic. I'm going to let Lori tell you all about the memorial service. I'll, I'll tell you the story and really how it happened. And thank you all for inviting me today. Um, I haven't been that involved with preservation in a long time, and I miss all of it and hope that thy next quarter of my life will be back again and getting more engaged. Helena was absolutely remarkable in so many ways. And Randy was playing, my, my husband passed away a few years ago, but Randy was Dave Brubeck, uh, was part of the Dave Brubeck Quartet for 35 years. And he was Dave's drummer. And he was playing at, um, what's the name of the hall in East Hampton? Um, can't remember the name of it, but it's a well-known hall. And they also have exhibitions there. And Tony and Helena came to see the quartet. And so I was sitting with them and by this point, Helena was sick. And she said, when I die, I want you to talk, persuade Randy to play at my funeral. I said, well, that's ridiculous. It's gonna be forever. And it's, you know, who knows where, you know, she said, no, we have to talk about it. And so that night we actually talked about it. And when Helena died, I got a call from Dean Morton, Jim Morton from St. John the Divine and said, you know that Helena um, converted to, I guess she was born a Catholic. Somebody may want to correct me. And she true. converted to uh, Episcopalian. I see Mosette is shaking her head. And um, he said in her, I have this written down that Randy, my, Jim knew Randy as well, because they used to play at St. John the Divine and said, Randy agreed to do this. And I remember saying to Randy, you know, Rand, do you remember doing this? And I did. He said, but I figured she was never going to die. <laughs> and I, not only that, I mean, he was a very exceptional musician and very, very creative, but he was also a very shy person. I remember he played in a quartet. He didn't play by himself. And it was, he said, it's one of the, I have tears in my eyes thinking about it because he said it was really one of the highlights of his musical career, being able to do that. So he played, I think, Rita, I can't remember how many people there, but I just remember sitting up, sitting close to the front and then having to speak, because I think I was the Landmarks Commissioner at the time, of course, and he, I just was thinking, oh, we're in a Dino De Laurentiis movie. This is, I've never <laughs> seen anything like it. We, yeah. there, there, is, there is somewhere, I think, still, that whole service was taped. It was taped. Uh, I hope I, don't I still have a copy. Yeah. I know it, that Randy it, did, so. You know, I, I, the story I heard was she converted. Yes. So she could have the funeral at St. Exactly. John. Exactly. That's what I heard. That's right. That is correct. That's the, what Dean the Morton Catholic, told me. The Catholic Church wouldn't have allowed That's right. <laughs> Andy to so, play the drum, let alone all the everything. Exactly. Everything. So he played, the, I remember, I took, I think I took him up there in a city car. I probably could get, you know, arrested for that with his drums and everything and putting him. And then, so he did the processional and the recessional. It was both. It was, right. so, whoever was there, it was so dramatic. It was great. Great. So incredible. May I say one other thing, Tony, unless you want me to come back to this, is that I know you just said that she died in 1991, and I, I became the commissioner in 1990, and as we all recall, we all fought to try to make sure that the um, Guggenheim would not have that extension. And I remember the, um, I think we lost in court, the building went ahead, and the minute that it went ahead, she called me. And with all that honey, I remember, and Tony Robbins may remember this too and may want to add to it, but that was one of the first buildings that we actually held a hearing and it was designated so fast because I wanted to make sure she would be alive for it. She also was very involved in with the battle around the Whitney mm -hmm. uh, and the desire to, of the Whitney to expand and demolish the brownstones. Yes. So she called those row of brownstones her corps de ballet. 
Oh, yes. <laughs> in, in, in very, very Helena-esque language. Britt, let's turn to you and, and where you fit in in this, in this narrative. I think by the time you arrived on the scene, Helena had had enough birthdays, anniversaries, that she convinced her husband to give her by then computers, printers, Xerox machines. Uh, but <laughs> tell us when you landed and some of your unique experiences with this great lady. <laughs> unique, yes. Um, so I arrived in, uh, I think, December of 89, and um, Tony had been referred, I, had, I was moving to New York, and um, I asked someone I knew um, about getting a job in the not-for-profit world, and they said, oh, you have to talk to Tony Wood, he knows everybody and knows everything. And so I called him, and he said, oh, it's so great you called, I'm looking for someone for a nice lady on the Upper East Side who runs a preservation group. So I went there and met her and she said, okay, great, you're hired. Um, and um, and that, was, uh, that was history. And I worked, uh, someone talked about the, mentioned the Barbizon. I did work in the Barbizon office and I'm sort of calling it an office is, a, is, a, um, is much greater than it really was. It was a, um, it was probably like five by eight awesome. bedroom. And it was when the, they dated from the time when the Barbizon was a, was a women's hotel, single room occupancy. And, um, and there were still quite a few people there, including Alice Sachs, who lived there, um, who was on community board eight. And I would arrive in the morning and there would all be these little old ladies scurrying about in their nightgowns and, and, and bedroom slippers. Um, so that was, a, uh, that was an interesting experience. I think it was owned by one of the board members, maybe David Teitelbaum. Maybe Teitelbaum owned, owned it for a while. Yeah, it. yeah. And um, so that was a really uh, awful little hole that, that I did everything I could to not be there. Rit, you forgot that the reason you saw those ladies is because none of you had a bathroom. There was a communal bathroom. Right, right. I don't know where, I didn't use, I could not have used it. <laughs> I can't imagine that they would let me in there, but I don't remember. There must have been a bathroom for guests <laughs> on a lower floor, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. Male persuasion. So, um, so I would run up 10 blocks to Helena's um, house, you know, 20 times a day um, and, um, and do her, her bidding. Um, but um, we did, we, it, was a, it was a difficult relationship. She was actually a very hard person to work for. Yes. <laughs> Rita alluded to, to that and, and, and Rita didn't actually work for her even though Helena didn't realize that probably. <laughs> but, um, but we did, you know, so I worked from, that, from 1989 until she died. So that was about 13 or 14 months. Um, and we, we did, um, become very fond of each other and we, we did have a good time. So she was, um, she was great in that I had moved from uh, Boston and I really didn't know anything about New York other than you know having been there a lot, but not anything about the city workings. And so she was very inclusive and you know wanted me to go to Landmarks Commission and Board of <laughs> Estimate that was around then and community board meetings. And um, so I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the city that, that um, was very useful later on when I became the executive director. The uh, interesting thing, it, it, let's talk a little more about kind of her operating style. Uh, you know, one of the things I remember is she knew, I mean, yes, she would know the chairman of, an, of, the, com of the various commission, but she would also know the secretaries. Yes. I mean, she kind of knew everyone uh, and knew them to the point of, you know, if they had a baby, she'd go out and buy them a you know, baby present. I mean, so right. she really was a highly personable person, but also strategically, she, she knew how to penetrate organizations and, and commissions at various levels and, and really had, I don't know that she had moles in place, but she had relationships and was kind of beloved by a lot of people in, in authority who, who would then become helpful to her. Lori, you had to work with her in an official capacity. I mean, it must have been something because she was so... I mean, violated all the all the all the rules in, in a sense of distance and professionalism and all. I mean, share some of what that was like. And you knew her before you were chair too. I did know her before I was chair, and I also um, she actually Randy and I spent a lot of time with Tony and with Helena, a lot of time. 
at their incredible house. It just, it was, I think maybe because, you know, Tony was a sculptor, he was really interested in jazz. Um, it was just such a pleasure just to be with them. And um, actually when we were all four together, I must tell you, she, she didn't always talk about um, the, you know, what she needed to accomplish, what was going on, but she was really clever always about someone would drop by. So it could have been um, Helen Frankenthaler. It could have been someone that she wanted to make sure that people were engaged. And then she would also bring up what the, the, the more recent fight was her concerns. I've never, ever, I never met anyone like her in my entire career, no matter what I've ever been doing, because you're right, she had that um, wonderful honeyed way of always getting what she wanted. And I don't remember anybody ever really saying no. And I think that because of that wonderful way of, and Tony would never say no to her. <laughs> her husband, who I don't even remember what year he passed away, but he, they were quite a team. And she was, as you know, relentless. But it was, I'm, I realized well, out of any, everyone that I knew in the field, I probably spent more time with her than anyone else, except for maybe Margot Wellington, who also, as you know, I worked for her for years. And we were all, we've also been, been friends for decades. And, and Felina, Kalina even had very friendly relationships with, with what I would call the evil empire people. I mean, the, the, uh, you know, all the, those lawyers, the big real estate lawyers yeah. who were always coming down to the commission to do some evil. And she would come in and smile and it would be like old home week. And then she'd oh attack them. You know, I mean, exactly. it, was, yeah. it was, it was, it was, it was remarkable. But I also think what was so extraordinary is that she wanted to know about you. It wasn't, it doesn't matter who else was there. It wasn't only about, let's say just me. Yes, I was a commissioner at that point, but even before other people, she, it wasn't only her story. She wanted to know people's stories. It was when you said, you know, John, friends, that she was so sincere about that. It was such an important part of her DNA. Yeah, I, I would remember having lunches with her at Mortimer's and like she would know everybody. I mean, she would just know everybody who was coming in, was working there, was just the way, way she was. So true. Rita. Jump I want in. to add something about her personality and she undoubtedly had what you would call today people skills and full of charm and all that. But one of the pr uh, things that she was most proud of uh, for having accomplished is the monitoring system. And she oh. single-handedly put together uh, uh, a platoon of 120 monitors. And how did she go about doing this? And Lori's right. She takes a personal interest in you. You are introduced to her for the first time. She's extending her hand to shake your hand. And she asks you, you know, who, who, what your name is and, you know, who, something about you. And then she asks, where do you live? And the next thing you know, you're a monitor for that block. And that's, how, you know, officially a monitor before you know it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She was terrific engaging people and uh, also very effective at the community board. Yes. Uh, and and with, with all of that. But speaking about a uh, 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 platoon, she had a platoon of stand-in speakers is what I call it. As you know, you know, when you go to the Board of Estimate, that's the last step to get something uh, uh, approved. And the more people that show up, of course, the greater the chances that, that of importance of an, a particular issue before the politician. What she would have is encourage people to either show up or write, but she didn't have, so some of these people could not be there physically because some of these meetings went on until 11 o'clock, you know, from nine o'clock in the morning. So she would have a platoon of us and hand these testimonial, written testimonials for us to read on behalf of somebody else who can't be there. That was her success. <laughs> yeah, she, uh, things have changed a bit since, since then, John. I mean, it's interesting. You, uh, you saw the world back then and you know the world today. It's, it's kind of, I don't know how Helena would play in today's world. What do you think? It's interesting. You know, one time when she got extremely angry at me, she was really livid at me, was, uh, do you remember the AIA used to have a publication, I think it was called the Oculus? Yes. And, oh. and there was a column they did about some development site on the Upper East Side. And the person who interviewed me, and at the very end of the column, I, had a, I was quoted as saying something about stopping development at this site which you know, nowadays seems very benign. And she was livid at me because she said, you know, John, we're not against development. You know, it just has to be the right kind of development. It has to be appropriate. Uh, and she was really uh, very upset that I, I had that one sentence really being against, uh, expressing being against development. 
Um, well, you know, Hel Helena was, I don't know how much she was trained by, but she was very much part of a group of advocates that really were somewhat tutored by one of your predecessors, Dorothy Minor, who was very good at coaching people and saying, you know, you've got to focus on what is the purview of the Landmarks Commission. And the purview of the Landmarks Commission is not stopping development. So seeing her react that way is very much what the culture was, you know, as, as the grassroots preservation groups in the 80s and 90s were kind of feeling their own and all, it was very much got to keep it on the issues that are relevant to the commission. Uh, right. So that's, 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 that's what that was behind, you know, behind her mm -hmm. comment. Tony, I, I think we'll, we'll roll into question and answer yes. session now, if that works for everyone. That and works? Who, do, who do we have? Well, I have one to start things out with. Um, but first, I thought maybe we do a little poll here. So one moment here while I get this set up. Um, because I think one, one thing that came to me was how many people actually knew um, Helena in real life. So well, those of you who are relatively new to Zoom, there's a polling function which will somehow magically appear in front of us. Hmm. Maybe. Yes, we'll, we'll find out. You know, Zoom is being Zoom right now, so I think we'll just skip that and let's go right into the Q&A. Um, but that's a general question to those on the, on the Zoom call today is, did you know Helena? And if so, um, even if you don't have a question, um, if you have some particular insight into her work as a preservationist, uh, definitely let me know in the chat and then I can unmute you and we can hear from you. But the question I had for you, Tony, and for the panel was, was there anything particular about the Upper East Side that she saw architecturally or sort of in an urban planning sense that really drew her to this effort to preserve it through a historic district? Or was this more, this is where I live and I want this place to be the special thing that it is? It may have been a combination of both because mm -hmm. she chose to live there originally. Mm -hmm. But I mean, being she was Polish and she grew up in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you look at the, you know, the, the Upper East Side has lots of architectural styles, but you know, originally it was being called the Beaux Arts District in, in some of the early, uh, and there had been advocacy efforts for many years prior to this to try and get a historic district. So Kent Barwick gets a lot of credit for moving moving it along and making it a priority. But I think it was the beauty of the district. I don't think she was doing a, you know, it wasn't a, it's my backyard. I mean, it was her backyard, but I think she saw its larger architectural importance and value to the city. Okay. Uh, John, Rita? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I agree. She, uh, she never, I mean, she felt that the whole city was her, you know. Yeah, <laughs> mm. yeah she fought, I mean, she got involved in many citywide issues. So she, was not, she was not parochial. She got involved in policy issues when th there were threats to how the commission could operate. And she knew that that needed, you know, she needed to be part of that. The, the battle in Albany uh, with the effort to remove religious properties from right. the authority of the landmarks law. So she, you know, she, as I say, was, the great path for many preservationists is you start maybe planting I, trees and then on your own block and then you understand you have to be part of the larger issues. I think I would call her an urbanist then. Yeah, I think that's a great line. I think that's a, and our friend Roberta Gratz would, would very much love to see that term being being used. I think that's true. Britt, what, I mean, from your time with her, what, what, how do you feel about that? I mean. Um, yeah, I'm not sure um, how, I mean, I came, you know, later on, so I'm not sure. Um, uh, I think she was really interest, interested in the intricacies of how things got done also. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, it's funny, Tony had his thing and was very occupied with his art. And um, so I think it was also very important for her to have, a, to sort of have, that was her calling that would, would equal his his calling. Okay. I see in the chat that Tony Robbins noted that he knew her a bit. Tony, would you like to unmute and tell us a bit about your interactions with Alina? Uh, I, it, well, you know, it's something that Lori said that uh, reminded me of a phone call. Um, she didn't, she called Lori. She knew everybody in the agency. She called, had no problem figuring out who the staff were who needed to be called. Um, and she called me, I think I was, I've only been there a few years. I think I was the deputy director of research maybe. Um, and I still remember not being able to hang up. <laughs> I just kept talking. 
um, it was a one long run on sentence of a phone call. And she was so sweet and so nice. You know, in theory, I could have said, oh, excuse me, somebody's calling me, but you couldn't. There, there was just no way. And that's extremely powerful. Those of us who were on the staff of the commission have all been abused, pardon me, folks, but it's true, uh, sure. by uh, people from the community. And God bless them, that's how things get done. Nevertheless, it's not a lot of fun to be on the uh, receiving end, especially since staff don't have a lot of real power at the commission, we can't vote. Um, so there were people I just dreaded getting phone calls from, but not Helena, it was always a play. It was hard to get off the phone, but it was always, you know, you got off the phone, you wrote, that was really nice. I hope she calls again. Oh. And she would. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes indeed. That's, that's all I have. Okay, that's thank you. And I see also that I know Jeremy Woodoff um, had some interaction with her. Jeremy, would you like to share any of your memories from working with her or interacting with her? I'm, I would love to accept. I have very only a very vague memory. I know that I met her and conversed with her, but don't remember about what, and it was never extensive. Um, I, I do recall a project or two on the Third Avenue sidewalk clock at nine, around 96th Street, I think. I don't remember for sure if she was involved with that, but that could have been uh, when we were in touch. Got it. So one other question I had, and this might pertain to some people who have chimed in already or some of the other folks on the line from Friends, but to what extent was Helena involved in or crucial to getting additional districts on the Upper East Side designated after the initial Upper East Side Historic District? Rita, you might be best positioned to have some thoughts on that. You know, I don't have that strong um, uh, uh, recollection of that. I mean, it was always over uh, an unauthorized uh, um, development. You remember Jean Brown when she lived on 63rd Street? And we were all fighting this battle about number nine, number 11, number 13. And the, the, the developer was going to put up, you know, a huge uh, uh, building. It's battles like that, or the Sliver building, the Vizcaya, you know, things like that. That's what I remember the most. Uh, or the Cody building, um, um, all around the city, the religious properties. But not so much trying to get more historic districts or more landmarks, except Lieber House. I remember Lieber House very well. Yeah, yeah. Her advocacy for that. Well, you know, and, and when she put S on Friends of the Upper Side Historic yeah. there were predecessor districts that existed on the Upper East Side before the big Upper East Side district. Uh, small kind of more. Metropolitan. Kind of, yeah, yeah, the uh, Metropolitan. Uh, I think had Pendleton Place, place I think, was already. Yeah, um, so, so she kind of aggregated the existing exactly. under. Took over. <laughs> yeah, under, under, her, under her banner. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting, and maybe it'd be interesting to get other people's reflections on this. I mean, Helena was such a powerful force uh, that, you know, when she died, she wasn't a huge one about institutional building, in a sense. So she was such a presence at Friends that, you know, it then, it, you know, it was a, when she died, there was the need for a transition. You know, she, she wasn't anyone who would have planned for succession planning. That's true. <laughs> uh, I mean, we all knew she was going to live forever. She did. Randy did. I mean, uh, but... You were our transitional president. Yeah, yeah. It was... <laughs> but anyway, so, it, I mean, you know, the only... Not to falter, but I, I think it's not unusual that people who are such a dominant and founding leader don't necessarily think that much about what comes next. True. Uh, and it's... Uh, exciting to see that you know friends has evolved over time in many iterations and i think today friends is probably as close to being the friends of helena's period uh, minus the run on sentences and a few <laughs> other things uh than than maybe in any time in its history uh i mean it's kind of back to that mix of advocacy and education and convincing people so it's 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 great i think to see that i think david's here david yeah Yes. Uh, uh, can you unmute, unmute me for a moment? Yes, you're all set. Go right ahead, David. Okay. Uh, Margot Wellington kind of threw me at Helena when the organization was first formed. And uh, I was so skeptical. She seemed so scattered and unfocused. But she was astonishingly effective. She 
spent a lot of time with me saying, I don't want to have anything to do with raising money. That's your job and the job of other people. That's not my job. I'm uh, going to connect with everyone. And uh, I remember a birthday party she had where she had letters from the governor, from the mayor. She was very influential. And uh, I, I do remember her beating up Brit and John Weiss. <laughs> she, she was uh, very Thank you, nice. David. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. She was very nice to me uh, and, and was often very solicitous and spent a lot of time with me. But uh, she was uh, definitely not an easy boss for those she saw as the people who worked for her. Very true. The house of therapy going, John and Brett. I mean, you know, <laughs> it takes years to work that, work that all out. Uh, back to your point, David, about kind of the, the letters you would get from elected officials. If my memory is right, Lori, I, I think it, uh, the mayor did speak at her memorial service, is my memory. And I can't remember, I mean, there were other luminaries besides yourself there who spoke. But um, I do believe that he spoke. I don't remember what he says said and I wish I could remember who else had spoken and I don't but it was quite a group of people but she did I mean she worked all the elected officials I mean I maybe there more other than, elected officials who did speak yeah she you know she worked elected officials maybe even more have in today Rita what are you holding up program from the memorial service oh my gosh <laughs> oh Rita I love it okay well educate yeah. Rita, I would love for you to send me um, an email of, of who was there or anything that you can. I'd be so grateful. It just it does have, uh, I think Dinkins was a speaker. Yeah, yeah that, would, that would make sense. Yeah. Tony, we, uh, we have two more people here who I think might have some what? items to chime in on. So first, Jeff Gold, if you wanted to share a thought or two about Helena. Mute myself. Hello. Uh, thanks for everybody's memories. Uh, I work with her to save city and suburban housing, and I was also hired in the old days as a consultant to people on Long Island and Los Angeles. Uh, also, not always happy stories. Maybe it's me, but she was always supportive. And I do remember one instance because she would lose her patience with me and some others when she didn't think we were working hard enough. Um, and she had a way of seeming to work indefatigably, as you know, with the, the pre-social media age. One wonders what she'd be like now on Twitter. Um, <laughs> I was in the Board of Estimate. I was queued up. I can't even remember what we were saving, I'm ashamed to say. But I had to go back to my day job. And in those days, I was an acquisitions editor in architecture and planning, but I had bosses. And I was trying to get someone, you know, to speak for me, and I couldn't. And she just laid into me. She said, "You're letting us down," <laughs> you know. And a couple of the people on the, you know, uh, council people I knew were actually defending me. You know, Jeff has to go to work. He has people to support. <laughs> but on balance, when I, I trained some younger planners. I'm a planner by trade and a preservationist. I always mention Helena. And I'm never sure, I mean, she's a model of a certain type, a certain class, a certain era, but she's essential. And that energy needs to be, and I think has been transmitted through friends and NIPAP and younger people I work with on the Upper East Side and elsewhere to this day who were all born after Helena died. So um, there is a transmission belt and I learned not to give up from her and some of you on this. Zoom call. Well, you know, one of the things that just triggered, I'd, I'd love to figure out a way to keep Helena's name more out there. Uh, you know, an internship named after her, an award named after her, and it'd be wonderful. Maybe friends can think of, of a way because her name shouldn't be forgotten. I mean, she shouldn't be forgotten to be rediscovered in a hundred years, like, you know, Albert Bard or somebody. Uh, we need to keep that memory alive because it, it is inspirational, you know, scary, but inspirational. <laughs> No. Other people teed up. Rita, did you want to say something? I was going to say that whenever I talk about Helena these days, people don't know whom I'm talking about. Very mm. sad. Mm -hmm. No, and that, that, that's very sad and something that we, we all need to figure out how to remedy. Um, I know we're getting relatively close to yes. the, the end of our coffee cups, but I wanted to circle back to our, our panelists 
the guests, the friends, to any, any thoughts or memories that have come up that you haven't had a chance to share uh, or insights about the great lady? I'm just going to add, um, I apologize. I have to get on a shed call. And Tony, I just want to jump in that. What I do think is very important is that it's so, we have to figure out a way to honor her. And I would love to work on that to figure out a way to really continue in her legacy, whether it be a, a scholarship or anything that can keep her alive. Because um, as we continue to uh, move on in our own lives, let's not forget what she really has accomplished. Um, it's, it's so, I mean, to be a, have been a part of it. I feel that I had so many successes because of Helena. Yeah. Tony? So, I'm sorry, I'm gonna uh, leave. Thanks, uh, for, thanks for joining, Laurie. Uh, Hi, Laurie. Great, thank you. Tony? Uh, Yes, read it, please. I just, want to, I just want to mention one last thing. Of course, during her lifetime, she won uh, uh, many awards. But the one that I wanted to bring to everyone's attention or to remind them, and you were there, Tony, was the Doris C. Friedman Award to be presented annually to an individual or organization for, quote, a contribution to the people of the city of New York that greatly enriches the public environment. I thought that was a very high honor, and Dinkins was there to present that award. No, and she also got the Landmarks Line Award from uh, the upper, from uh, Historic Districts Council uh, yes. at the at the end almost. I made a list of fourteen for friends. Yes, right. <laughs> will appear on our website hopefully. There we go. John, any any closing thoughts? I, I was going to say one of her other legacies is I think Friends has become a uh, sort of a, a training ground for a lot of great preservationists. For instance, I work with Lisa Kersavage who also was an executive director at Friends, and now she's the executive director of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. So I think, you know, over the past 39 years, many, many preservationists have gone through Friends, learned a lot, and then stayed with us to work in the field, which is a terrific legacy for Helena. You know, and I yeah. think John, that's a, a great point, even for the large, if you look broadly at so many of, of our good neighborhood preservation groups, or maybe even regional, if you want to call them that, groups, have been training grounds now for decades for a lot of people who are now well in the profession. So I, I think people don't quite recognize that's such an important contribution of groups like Friends or Landmark West or GVSHP. You know, it's, it's a great legacy. You're absolutely right. Rita. I was going to say that I, I did embarrass uh, John Weiss for that very point, that we, were, we are proud of graduating so many distinguished uh, uh, executive directors that went on to better jobs. Just as John Weiss did to become uh, deputy uh, counselor for the uh, LBC. And at one of the uh, uh, hearings, I went and congratulated him that he is now at the table. And he turned all red. <laughs> <laughs> Remember I do. that? <laughs> I do. <laughs> Rick, any, any closing thoughts? Um, you know, the one, I have to say, the one thing I remember most about Helena is a little silly thing. She called, she used a messenger service. Oh. She must have called messenger services 20 times a day because she never wanted to, you know, send in the, uh, did she even, no, we didn't have email. Did we have email? I no, can't even remember. <laughs> and, but she didn't want, you know, she faxed and things, but she thought messengers were the best, except they were incredibly incompetent. And she never believed that her, her message, her, her paperwork would get there, but she called them. And every single time she called, she would say, this is Helena Rosenthal. I'm at 173 East 73. And I'm sure the people on the other end said, yes, Mrs. Rosenthal, we know where you are. We'll come and pick up your package. But she said the exact same thing every time she called. <laughs> One oh, of those strange that, things. That is very, very Elena. Uh, Brad, you're running the show. How are we doing? We are doing just fine, although I think we are three minutes shy of wrapping up entirely here. So I don't know if Mosette Broderick wanted to chime in. Mosette, you've had some great notes in the comments. Let me see if I can actually unmute her here. One second. Mosette, we're in the process of unmuting you. So hopefully that'll happen. Yeah, I, I, thank you all. I had trouble getting in, but that was my own problem. Um, the, uh, things I remember are two Victorian red brick buildings, which I think she was, I, I do remember, and I put that in the chat, uh, and Tony Robbins knew what it was. I'd forgotten. She was very eager to save that. Uh, was it a convent? I, I don't remember now. She, and I, I remember thinking, oh, well, there's a good one like that. 
What I didn't know was the good one like that had been totally gutted. She was perfectly right. That was the one to say. And wasn't she involved with the Turnferein on 85th Street? And she, prob she probably would have been. That was one of the great tragic losses where the community would rather have a landmark, a potential landmark demolished as opposed to turned into a disco. Yeah. That's that, those are the things I remember. I remember she was generous uh, and did come to other people's things, to other people's events. And that's in contrast to some other people. Uh, she did get herself over and was always there at, at a time when there was a little more camaraderie. I think the funny thing about all of this in my old age is that the Upper East Side, where I lived as a young person too, uh, was such a example of New York City's best living quarters. It's where all the power people lived. And the Upper East Side in its own way has changed. It's become a wonderful place, but the pressure is on living in other parts of the city. Is it time for the Upper East Side to regain its status perhaps? Not, not a tactful thing to say, but uh, it, it, the Upper East Side's day or Upper East Side's uh, bus has gone out of the block for a while. Well, some of us are really happy that it's so unfashionable that yeah. it's quiet and yeah, it's I agree. become somewhat affordable on the edges, believe it or not. Yes, I do. It's least expensive real estate in the city. But we will see, we'll see what happens when uh, we go back to a city where real estate in general has no value, uh, uh, where the suburbs crash in. Uh, but the sanctity of the Upper East Side, uh, uh, it's just shocking how different it became. And who ever thought we'd go downtown? Or Brooklyn. Or did we ever think that you'd fall off the edge of the earth if you uh, went above 14th Street, would become a motto for people? That it would develop in Soho and develop in the Meatpacking District and all that area, get to be so uh, pricey? I never thought that would happen. But to be truly woke, you have to live in Brooklyn. That's true. Under 35, though. We're too old. <laughs> it's only under 35. Uh, Brad, I know we have to wrap this up, but I'm wondering if, if any of the folks on the call uh, who are now actively with friends want to just say anything about their thoughts of, about Alina, whether she's, you know, she floats in their minds ever. Or they, I know that you, friend still has all her papers, and I can imagine there occasionally uh, one of those wonderful letters surfaces to the top, but I uh, just want to give any of our friends from friends a chance to, to say something if they wish. Laura, anybody? Or not. <laughs> well, I, I'll say something, even though I'm the, probably the most interim of, you know, um, being there. Um, I'm, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Felicia Mero, and I'm the interim executive director while Rachel Levy is on maternity leave. And to have the opportunity, knowing friends, um, just from my experience in the preservation field, and then being part of it now, it has just been an incredible experience um, to be part of the history and to learn about Helena and how she has created and the legacy that she created and where Friends is now and how that is all coming together. It's, um, uh, and listening to everybody, it just, it just underscores uh, that uh, the work that's going on today is, is as important as it was before. Um, but just the, um, I, I feel that everything that everyone has said just, makes me think that, uh, well, Friends is here to stay and it's doing a great job. Well, I think that's a, a great note to, to end on. Friends is here to stay and we're lucky to have Friends protecting that neighborhood and being an active voice on, on citywide issues. So Brad, do you want to close us out? Yes, no, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for coming today. Our next program is actually slated for this Friday evening. It's our happy hour and that's at 5.45 p.m. on Zoom and we will have a panel. It's a very loose panel since it's a happy hour, but it's Adrian Untermeyer, uh, Lucy Levine, and myself talking about George McEnany and looking at someone who actually lived on the Upper East Side. Um, and we are looking at finding the thread. How did he move from someone who was much more of a Robert Moses style character in the teens 
to an out and out preservationist by the late 1940s who helped start the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So we'll be looking at the various steps along the way in that transformation over time, but we hope you'll join us. And how about at this point, if I unmute everyone and you can give a little round of applause to all of our speakers today. Thank you so much for everyone for chiming in. Thanks Thank everybody. You for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Brad. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.